Radcliffe, Noah, Aaron Smith, Brenda Stevens, Chari, Christian, Brian. Wow, everyone here today. Uh, let me see if they're recording, and then I will start. I plan to spend a few minutes talking about how stuff is organized in, uh, in Canvas before uh, we actually get into uh, the class. So, Canvas, your screens are going to look different than mine because I have, you know, uh, I have the courses that I'm teaching and I have, uh, I'm an instructor, but the home page will be here. There will be announcements posted periodically. It's a good idea to log in between classes, so maybe sometime tomorrow and maybe sometime before next Monday uh, to just check to see if I have any announcements. Uh, I post things like corrections, uh, common questions that I get if, if three or four people are asking the same question, I might preemptively go and, and post an announcement that explains something or notes or if I'm going to miss a class or anything like that, I'm able to post as an announcement. So be sure to log in periodically and see. Um, a lot of you have probably had me for other classes. Looking around, I see some familiar faces. Um, but just to review, um, the syllabus we'll spend a few minutes talking about uh, in a minute. Uh, and modules is the other really important part. I imagine you're all pretty familiar with Canvas. Um, so I won't really focus on, um, um, you know, um, how Canvas works, but I'll, I'll focus on how this class is going to be using uh, Canvas. Uh, in under modules, there is sort of a general course information and a week one uh, um, folder, and there will be a folder for each subsequent week that will have uh, the weekly assignments in it. The top part of the syllabus shows all the ways to get a hold of me. Um, they include phone, email, email through Canvas. Generally speaking, it's better to email than to phone, but if you can't, if you're not in a position where you can email, you can always phone. You can use Skype, but, um, you know, contact me and make sure, um, you know, schedule an appointment for Skype so I can make sure that I add you. Uh, on there and you add me and all that. You know, it's not like, you know, if I'm on Skype, feel free to call me, you know. Um, you know, contact me and schedule an appointment uh, for Skype. I will post my office hours uh, once I've, I've finalized them. Um, in addition to my formal office hours, uh, I make all of my labs available for any of my classes. So, for example, this class has a lecture from one to two and then has a uh, lab from 2 to 3. Well, from 2 to 3 is this class's normal lab period, but I've also invited any students in any of my class to show up for that lab. Um, and by the same token, you are invited to any of my other classes' labs. So I have a, a lab from uh, 10 to 11 AM, uh, and you're, you can come to that. And then I have a couple of labs on Tuesdays and Thursdays as well. So. The nice thing about that is it almost sort of extends my office hours. So if you can't get to my office hours or whatever, you know, maybe you can come to one of my other classes' labs. A lot of students have taken advantage of that, and I think it's a win-win situation. For the most part, the labs are your times to work on things. So unless you have questions, you, a lot of times I'm just sitting there, you know, maybe reading or maybe doing other work or whatever. Uh, that way, uh, I made it available for other people so that I can, I can answer their questions if there aren't students in, in that particular class that has it. Now, when all else fails, um, we can arrange something else if nothing else works. So if you can't make my office hours and you're not available during my other classes' lab periods and so on, but you still need additional assistance, we can, we'll figure something out. Just contact me and let me know. 
and I can schedule to be here at times different than my normal office hour or lab schedule. Um, the idea is, though, is you have to sort of be uh, proactive with that, you know. Uh, we each have responsibilities when, when it comes to this class, you know. I, I am to uh, prepare materials and prepare assignments and explain things and answer questions. You have to let me know how it's going and you have to let me know if you're having difficulty with something. Because uh, I can, you know, we could do a lot and, and, you know, I've worked with students in the past before that have had issues and we figured things out, but I have to know that there's an issue. I have to know that you're having difficulty with something uh, in order for me to, to answer your questions and give you extra assistance. I would encourage you not to wait too long before asking questions. Um, simply because, um, you know, the class builds, each week sort of builds on previous weeks and if you're stuck on something and you're having a difficulty with that, then each subsequent week is only going to get harder and harder. It's not like each unit is like a standalone unit where you can start fresh every week. Everything that we do builds on previous material, so therefore it's important if you're having trouble with something to get it addressed immediately or as quickly as possible. Um, here are the outcomes and the course description and outcomes uh, of what we're going to be doing uh, in this class. It's important to keep these in the back of your mind. The textbook for this class is listed here. In addition to that, uh, in addition to the hard copy of the book, I believe this book is available on Safari Books Online if you're not familiar with it. Uh, if you are or aren't familiar with it. If you're not familiar with it, uh, Safari Books Online is a service that here at LC we've subscribed to. And if you're on campus, you can connect to it automatically. If you're not on campus, you can connect to it, but you have to put in your uh, uh, library card information. So not your student number, but the, the number that's actually on your library card. So if you go to LC's library website, and you go to databases, one of the options is Safari Books Online. If you click on that, because we are on campus, it recognizes that this is coming from LC and it knows that here at LC we have a subscription, so it automatically logs you on to that. If you are off campus, if you are home or whatever and going through your wireless network, it won't automatically recognize that and you have to put in your, your uh, LC uh, library card number. What you can do then is you can search and for example the book in this class is Head First Java, second edition and you can bring it up and you can read uh, a full text version of it. I know that there's been problems with other classes in the bookstore. I, I can't figure out where the disconnect is between those things. But um, you don't have to get it from the bookstore, of course. Uh, Amazon will have this pretty inexpensively. and You might be able to find a used copy of it. Twenty four bucks. Amazon Prime. So pretty good deal. All right. My idea of a, a textbook or my philosophy with a textbook is that um, I don't necessarily read exhaustively from the textbook. I don't cover it page by page. Because you can read it and you can bring any questions you have with the textbook to class. I like to explain the stuff that I want to emphasize and I want to make sure are clear and sort of hit the high points and drill into those a little more depth. So um, the idea is that if you read the book and you attend lectures that you'll be better off than if you just did one or the other. So that's sort of my, my philosophy of, of the textbook. Instructor approach, this is your class. All right. 
does it matter if I cover the material? Um, if I cover it to a room of people that don't really get it and I'm, I'm losing people and I'm not explaining it adequately. All right. So I, uh, it's important that you ask questions. Um, teachers always say that if one student has a question, there's a good chance that other students will have it as well. So um, by all means ask. Um, if it's something that I don't think is a question that I want to address at that point in time, for example, if you were to ask me a question, something very specific about running Java on your machine at home, or something very specific to a program that you are writing, uh, I might tell you that we can discuss it in lab. Uh, but generally, most of the questions that you have, uh, it will benefit for other people to hear the answer to them as well. So by all means, ask. And if I don't want to cover it right then, I'll just say, let's talk about it in lab instead. I have a yes. More, more or less, yeah, yeah. In fact, if you look at the very bottom of the syllabus, it sort of roughly covers, covers the schedule. But keep in mind, this is kind of an approximate schedule. You know, we, we drift ahead, we drift behind, and so on. Plus, I bring in other materials and, and, and have other focuses. But roughly, that's where you should be as far as reading goes. That's OK. That's OK. Um, there's a list of college policies that um, I mention here, but I'm referring to the catalog, so you should take a look at them to understand them. Uh, policies on late work. Uh, I tend to be very flexible on late work with the thought that um, if, you, if you get something done a couple days late, if you learned it, good for you. you know? I mean, in the grand scheme of things, that's not a huge issue. The problem comes in is if you are continually late on something, uh, there'll be a point at the end of the semester where you will be in a position where you won't be able to catch up. So that's sort of the, the downside of that approach. Uh, so by all means, try to stay caught up with all the assignments. But know that if you fall a little behind, especially if it's just on a one or two week uh, situation, just let me know. Let me know what's going on. Uh, is, uh, are you not? Are you, have you fallen behind because you don't understand a particular concept that we're going over? Are you falling behind because you have had extra work responsibilities? You don't have to go into detail. You know, I'm not, not into finding out people's private business. You know, just tell me. I've, you know, I've had a heavy work schedule and you know, I've fallen behind or whatever, or personal responsibilities, anything like that. Just let me know. Just keep me in the loop. And if you do that, then I'll be very flexible as far as late assignments go. However, the flip side of that is if you are continually late and you keep getting later and later and so on, if, you, if you're late on lab one, that's going to delay your start on lab two and lab three and lab four. So if you get in sort of a pattern of that where you're continually late and you're falling further and further behind, then we need to talk because we need to, we need to make sure, we need to find what the issue is. Do you need to spend more time working on the assignments? Do I need to explain something to you that I didn't do a good job explaining in class? Whatever. Um, we have to figure out what's wrong, and, and, we'll, and we will. And I've had a number of students that have had very difficult times in classes. If they make the commitment to come and talk to me, and you know, there, there aren't a lot of problems that we can't figure out and solve. So by all means, uh, you know, come to me with any issues that you have. few more things about that. There will be approximately, in this class, there will be approximately 15 assignments worth five points each, and there'll be a final worth 25 points. And that should add up to 100 points. When you say final, is that a final project or a final? This is, a, this is like an exam. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I have some classes where there's a project, some classes there where there is a, an exam. I just look at the class and see if it's well if it's well suited for a project then I will have a final project instead of an exam. If I think a project is difficult for one reason or another then I'll have an exam. And in this class it's kind of like before you know, you know, it, it takes to the end of the semester for you to know everything that you need to do to do a project. So that would give you like 
a week to wrap up an entire project, and I'd rather not, not do that. So instead, there's, there's, a, there's a, a test. Um, standard 90, 80, 70, 60. Uh, this is approximately the schedule that we'll follow, and so on. The first assignment is in the week one folder. And we'll start on it, and we'll probably get to where you can do most of it and maybe figure out a few things about it. But we'll start uh, today with the stuff that you need to know to do this assignment. All right. I want to talk about a couple of things about, first of all, what you'll need to do to set up Java on your own machine, OK? Because I would imagine most of you want to be able to work on your own machine in addition to the machines here in, at school. So sure, the machines at school are set up to allow you to compile and run Java programs. But your machine at home may or may not be. Um, so I want to I want to talk about that. There's a good section here in the course information that talks about setting up your computers to do the assignments. Here's a textbook site that will have like example code and here's something about copyright that's not really relevant and it's not as relevant in this class. Uh it's mainly relevant in the web classes I have where people want to use images and so on. But this is very important, setting up your computers to do the assignments. And it says C page XVII in the text. All right. To do this, let, let me explain the procedure of creating and running a Java program. And let me explain it by actually doing it. And then we'll talk about what you need to do in order to run it. So we'll do it, we'll show sort of the end result first, and then we'll sort of backtrack and say, well, what do you need to do to get to this point? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run the standard Hello World application that just simply displays a message that says Hello World. So. I'm just going to copy this chunk of code. And I'm going to go into Notepad++. And I'm going to get rid of my 216 class materials. And I'm going to paste this code here. And I'm going to save this as a Java class. OK, we'll talk more about cl what classes are. Uh, suffice to say that every program has at least one class in it. All right? And this will have one class. Um, make sure that's enabled. You can do this. You can do this in lab. It would be a good exercise to do this in lab. All right. This is the Java source code. Does anyone know the definition of source code? Well, coding in the original language it was written in. And the idea about source code is it's written in what's typically called a higher level language which is a language that's easier for people to understand. All right? Uh, computers, strictly speaking, only understand machine code, which is very difficult for people to read and understand and do anything with. And they, you know, binary ones and zeros, all that kind of stuff. And that's very difficult for people to work with, so we've created all kinds of uh, the, the Computer uh, scientists have created all sorts of languages, of which Java is one of them. And Java source code is written in the Java language, but the computer doesn't directly execute that code. 
uh, you have to go through a process of calling compiling the code. All right. Generally speaking, there's two kinds of ways that code gets executed. It's either compiled or interpreted. All right. In the case of Java, you're going to go through a compilation process and compile it. All right. I'm going to save this as a Java source class. Those files have the extension .java. All right. And the first name of it, the, the first part of the name, is going to be whatever the class name is. Generally speaking, as a general rule, there will be one class per .java file. Now, there are exceptions to it, and there's other ways that it can do it. But in this class, for the most part, we'll have one class in every source file. So one class per .java file. So because, yes? Uh, more or less, yes. Yeah, you would you would give the name of the first class. Um, and again, it depends what the other classes are, because there's classes called inner classes and anonymous classes and all that. But as a good rule would be, yeah, I would use the the, the name of the first class. So if you put those two things together, we are going to call the source file for this particular class hello world dot java now you can get away with it on windows unfortunately but if you're going to really dot your i's and cross your t's you're going to make this case sensitive so that it runs well on other systems as well so in this case it will be hello world with capital h capital w dot java and a lowercase java General rule for class names is class names start with capital letters. So the first word of a class will start with a capital letter, and each subsequent word will start with a capital letter. So hello world, the H in hello is capitalized, and the W in world is going to be capitalized. So I'm going to go and save this. And I'm going to say it is a Java source file. It's a nice thing. You could, you could do this in Notepad too, but Notepad doesn't have the option of Java. You would just pick all files and type in hello world.java. And then you would type in hello world.java. And again, notice that I'm typing it in uh, matching the case of the class name. The class name was hello world capital H, capital W, so my file name is hello world, capital H, capital W. I'm going to save it in the desktop. Now we could save it in other folders as well. All right. We'll look at the details of this program in a minute. Suffice to say, all it says is hello world. All right. Nothing too earth shattering. So I click save. And we now have on our desktop Hello world dot Java. If we wanted to open it up again, we could right mouse and say edit with Notepad++. You could do all the same things with just plain old Notepad, but Notepad++ does have some nice features in it that we'll explore as we go through this course. And it's free on Windows. If you're not using Windows, if you're using a Mac, there's other equivalents to it. We're not going to use, at least not in the beginning of this class, an IDE. An IDE is a program like Visual Studio, all right? And students usually don't like the fact that we don't use an IDE, because IDEs like Visual Studio do a lot of stuff for you, all right? And that's great. It, it, it helps you get things done quicker and so on. I found, though, that sometimes students, that, uh, students uh, uh, over-rely on IDEs. And uh, they don't really learn stuff because the IDE does stuff for them, which means that if something goes wrong, they're less likely to be able to troubleshoot it. So we're going to, at least for the, for the first part of the semester, we're going to code everything um, just from scratch using Notepad or Notepad++. Okay, 
Now, we are not, this is the source code, which means this is a code that someone typed in in the Java language. But the computer can't directly execute this. We have to go through a process called compiling. And here's how that process works. We're actually going to go to the command line. All right. How many of you have had CISS 125, the operating systems class? Many, most, if not all, have had it. If you have not had it, that's fine. It's, it's not that hard to do. We're going to learn a handful, and we're going to use a handful of commands to compile it. All right. How do you get to the command line? Well, you can do it a couple different ways. Probably the easiest way is to right mouse, if you're on Windows 10, and pick Windows PowerShell. Windows PowerShell is um, sort of a, a newfangled replacement for the command line, but you can do a lot of the same stuff in it. And I'm going to go and make the, the font bigger so that we can all see it. All right. So there we are. Notice that we uh, see the directory that we're in. We're in the user directory for LCCC Lab. LCCC Lab is the name of the user on this computer. So if you did this on your machine, be whatever your username is. I put this on the desktop. So what I need to do is I need to get into that folder to do my compiling. So I'm going to say CD for change directory followed by desktop. And now it shows me that I'm in the folder C, LCC, C users, LCC lab, desktop. In other words, I am in this folder. I'm looking, because all the desktop really is is a special folder on your machine. So I'm in this folder. And I can do a directory listing to see all my files. You do a directory listing by typing in DIR. And it shows all of my files. Right here is my Java file that I just created, Java source file, hello world.java. If I want to clear the screen, I type in CLS, and that clears the screen. So the main command line code that you need to know is how to get to the command line, or PowerShell, how to change directories, how to get a directory listing, which we went over, and then specifically how to compile Java code. You compile Java code by typing in Java C and the name of the source file that you want to compile. That is assuming that Java has been installed. All right, Java has been installed on this machine, so I could do that. If Java had not been installed, it would have given me an error saying something like Java C is not recognized as a command, something along those lines. It's that sort of verbiage. But notice that it went and it didn't give me any message, which is a good thing. <laughs> All right. That means it compiled cleanly without any errors. Now notice when it compiles cleanly, we actually get a second file that ends with the dot class extension. All right? This file, if we tried to look at it, would be unintelligible to us. for the most part. This is not machine code. This is a special kind of Java byte code. And we'll talk about that in a minute here. But the bottom line is this is a code that our Java virtual machine is going to execute. All right, we'll talk a little bit uh, about the differences um, 
in a few minutes here. All right. How do you execute the program? You execute it by typing in Java and the name of your main class. Now this example, there's only one class, so of course it's the main class. Later on we're going to have examples where there's multiple classes. But one of them is going to be sort of the main class. So we type in Java and the main class, and then it goes and does its thing. And it says hello world. A lot of work just to do that, right? Okay. Let's talk more in detail about what happens, specifically what happens. Let's draw a little diagram. And then we'll talk about what you need to install for this to work. I have my file, which is my source code, which is dot Java. And I will probably have one file per class whose file name is the class name dot Java. Okay? File name dot Java. I run it through the Java compiler. which produces a dot class file. And this is called bytecode. When I type Java and that class, that bytecode is executed by what is called the Java Virtual Machine. And that goes and runs the program. This is sort of an extra step. But this gives Java one of its chief features. And that is it can be run on a number of different platforms. You should be in theory, able to take a Java program that I've written on a Windows machine and run it on a Mac, or run it on a Linux machine, or run it on a Unix machine. Shouldn't matter. All right? And what does that is the Java virtual machine in this process. Older programs. Older languages work like this. You would have source code, you would compile it, and you'd produce object code which was machine specific. In the case of Windows, it would be .exe. In the case of like a Mac, it would be a .app, I think. You couldn't take that code and transfer. You couldn't take a Windows EXE and run it on a Mac without some sort of additional level of translation or vice versa. I know there's programs that allow you to do that. Wine allows you to run on Mac or Linux machines, uh, Windows code, and so on. But there has to be like an extra level of transla uh, translation. This, machine, this code is machine specific. So therefore, other older programming languages compiled in a way where it wasn't necessarily easy to take the exact same code and run it in two different places. One of the promises of Java is that you can take the exact same code, you can take these class files, put them on any machine, and as long as that machine has a Java virtual machine, 
is able to uh, run that Java code. So you compile it once, you can run it on a bunch of machines. It's cross-platform, far more so than other programming languages. In practice, it works out pretty good. Okay. Yeah. Um, Java still, one of the prime benefits of it is that it is that. Uh, historically, Java has had some problems with efficiency and all that. Uh, but yeah, I would say it works out pretty well. To make a machine Java virtual machine? Uh, Android already has a Java virtual machine. The, the Java system is based on Java, or the, I'm sorry, the Android system is based on Java. iPhone, I'm sure there's no Java for it. I'm sure it's proprietary for a reason, and I'm sure they would not let you do it. But you can install Java on a Mac, and you can install it on Windows machines, and, and so on. All right? So, to do the magic that we did today, all right, of compiling and creating that program, what do we need? We need the Java compiler and the Java virtual machine. You need the Java compiler to create and compile code. You need the Java virtual machine to run Java code. So what will you need for this class? For this class, we obviously want to create, compile, and run Java code. To just run Java code without compiling and creating it, all you need is an application called the JRE, Java Runtime Engine. That contains the Java Virtual Machine. To create, compile, and run, the old word for it was the JDK. Let me see what it's called now, because I always forget. Yeah, Java SE downloads include the Java JDK server. All right. So you can go and... Stand, Java Platform Standard Edition Development Kit, or the JDK. So you could go and you can pick your operating system and download and install it. Linux, Mac OS, Solaris, and Windows. They also have demos and so on. And Windows X64 is the one you want for running. Yeah. Yeah, that would be, the, that would be this one. All right. Generally speaking, the downloading and the running part is pretty easy. You know, how hard is it to click a link and let it run? Depending on exactly what machine you're installing it on and so on, the one thing that you have to do is you have to add Java to your path. All right. How many of you are familiar with what are called environment variables? Okay. An environment variable is a variable that tells your machine certain things about the way your machine's configured. It's configuration information. It tells about the environment. There is one environment variable called the path. And what the path is, is the path is a list of directories that the command line will look for when you try to execute a program. So if I type in Java C hello world dot Java to compile it, there is actually a program out there called javac.exe. There's a program called javac.exe. 
Well, where is it? It's not in this folder. All right. It's not in that folder. Where is it? Well, you define what's called your path variable. If you type in path, it will show you Let's do this. You used to be able to do that, but this is PowerShell. There might be a different way. PowerShell yeah. Yeah, probably doesn't let you. Okay. Here is, if you go into environment variables, you can see path is one of them. Now, when you look at it, you will notice that Oh, wait a minute. Here we go. This, you can have different paths system-wide and for a particular user. If we look at this one, oh, it's not letting me because I'm not admin. Somewhere on that list is going to be the place where Java got installed to. If you do a quick Google for setting Windows 10 path for Java, JDK, if you're on Windows 10, it will tell you how to do that. Windows 8 and 10. It will give you information on how to do that. That is the one thing that people tend to either not do or not do correctly. So if you've installed the JDK and you've clicked on the link and you've installed it uh, and it still doesn't work, um, then most of the time people have that problem is because the path isn't configured correctly. All right. If you have questions about that, let me know and I can help walk you through it. It would be a good idea between now and Wednesday if you all make sure you have uh, that installed on your machine. Uh, we can play in the lab with it, by the way, um, but uh, it should already be installed in the lab. So you should be able to run Java programs without it. So what to do today in lab? Today in lab, I would suggest you download the Hello World example. That's the example that I went over, or, or that, I, that I showed you. I didn't show you details about it, all right? We'll talk about that more on Wednesday. There's a second Hello World program. that I'm going to download. I'll rename it. That randomly says hello world, or randomly says hello, and gives one of four names. We'll review this next time. All right? But you can take a look at that to start seeing how you can do arrays and randomness. Because your first assignment requires you to create some arrays and to create doing randomness. Now, those of you that have done C Sharp, which I assume all of you have, taken the C Sharp course or other programming language, the concepts are very similar in Java, and the coding style is very similar in Java. The difference is, at least to start, we're not going to be using IDE, so you really have to know them. But an array is simply a list of items, 
Instead of having one value, it can have multiple values. And you have to refer to a given element in the list. All right? And so you can take a look at that. Let's look briefly at the hello world. And let's make a couple of observations. And we'll go over it more next time. First of all, like C sharp, star slash starts a multiple line comment. And slash star will end the multiple line comment. Slash slash is a single line comment. And you can put that really anywhere. You can put a comment here if you want, after a line. One of the things that's important to do is to remember that there are braces around groups of things that go together. So everything in the class is included within a set of braces. Everything within a function will be included within a set of braces as well. Every program is going to have at least one class that is defined as public. So you'll see public class, and you'll see the name of the class, and then a brace. Every app will also have one method, method or function being the same thing, that is called main, that accepts a string array as arguments. And it will be defined as public static void. You don't have to know what those mean right this minute. Just know that every program that you run is going to have at least one class that has public static void main as a function. That is sort of the first function that gets run when you run the code. All right? And then it may call other functions. It may call a whole bunch, millions of other things, but that's the first one that gets called. This statement here is simply a statement to output a string. System out print ln simply says display to the default output a particular message. We're out of time for today, uh, but I'll go over this in more detail next time and we'll start looking at the second version of the hello world that does some randomization and prints out a name. All right? We'll see you up in lab.